I'm so delighted to introduce our next speaker, Laura Bates, whose 2020 book, Men Who Hate Women, was incredibly prescient. She's the founder of the Everyday Sexism Project, an ever-increasing collection of over 200,000 testimony, 200, testimonies of gender inequality. She works closely with politicians, police forces, businesses, schools, and organizations from the United Nations to the Council of Europe to tackle sexism and sexual violence. Her campaigning and advocacy work has seen Facebook change its policies on sexual violence, helped the British Transport Police, for example, to transform its approach to sexual assaults, increasing both reports and detection of offenders dramatically. She's contributed to putting consent and healthy relationships on the national curriculum. She's patron of the Somerset and Avon Rape and Sexual Abuse Support and a contributor at Women Under Siege, a New York-based organization working to end the use of rape as a weapon of war in conflict zones worldwide. She's a best-selling author of many books, including Everyday Sexism, Girl Up, and Men Who Hate Women, and writes regularly for the New York Times, Guardian, Telegraph, and others. She's an honorary fellow at St. John's College, Cambridge, and a fellow of the Royal Society of Literature. Laura. Hi, everyone. Thank you so much for having me. Um, I'm so grateful for the work um, of the CCDH. I think it's more important now than it ever has been. So I'm very glad to be with you today. Um, my research focuses on a very specific area of online hate and extremism, and that is extremist misogyny. Um, particularly the network of communities colloquially known as the Manosphere. Um, and it's useful, I think, to think of this as a form of male supremacy. So I'm going to tell you a little bit today about my research into these communities, how it came about and what some of my findings were. As a woman working in the public eye, and in particular a woman advocating on issues around sexual violence, around feminism and gender equality, you don't have to go looking for these communities because they come to you. Uh, from the beginning of my work over a decade, ago with the Everyday Sexism Project, um, from within a few weeks of starting the project until the present day, um, I've received a varying number of rape and death threats, um, ranging up to about 200 a day um, at particularly bad times. That gave me an awareness of and a window into some of the extremist online communities that exist with the very specific purpose of fueling and spreading hatred of women and inciting real world violence against women. However, there was a kind of received wisdom, uh, particularly around in the last sort of five to eight years, that you didn't give these groups the um, fuel of, of oxygen, that it was much better uh, not to give them attention, not to talk about them, not to risk uh, giving them a bigger platform. And it was, it was a, a kind of received wisdom that I generally agreed with. What changed my mind was that um, as a result of the huge number of the testimonies we receive that come from young people, from particularly girls being sexually assaulted and harassed at school, um, I began to spend a great deal of time working in schools with young people around issues like gender stereotypes, sexual violence, healthy relationships. And I would say between around 2018 and 2020, I noticed a real shift in the dynamic of the groups I was speaking to. It hadn't been a walk in the park before that. Um, you know, these are difficult topics. And of course, there were some challenging conversations and there was pushback. But generally speaking, until that point, the conversations were productive. From around 2018, it began to be clear that amongst the boys, there was usually a significant chunk, um, usually a minority, but a significant minority in, in any particular school I went to, whether it was a boys school, whether it was a mixed school, whether it was a state or a private school, who had been radicalized. And I don't use the term lightly, I think it is the accurate term here, although it isn't a term we tend to use in relation to misogyny. These were boys who were coming to sessions with preconceived notions about the Me Too movement, about the idea that feminism was a cancer that was taking over the world, about the idea that white men in particular are the real victims in today's society, 
convinced that the gender pay gap is a myth spread by a government and a media under the thumb of woke feminazis, convinced that women lie about rape, that men everywhere are used to losing their jobs because of um, vindictive claims made up by women. And um, these were often intractable beliefs. It was very difficult to tackle them because they were so ingrained. At this point, it became clear to me that the people who had been for some time harassing and abusing myself and female colleagues online were now having a much wider spread in terms of their impact, in terms of their influence. And at that point, it seemed to me that the argument that we shouldn't give them the oxygen of publicity was no longer a particularly effective one, since it seemed that they were actually doing incredibly well without, with or without publicity. And in fact, perhaps it was the lack of public awareness of the fact that these groups even existed that was preventing teachers, school staff and parents from being provided with the tools that they needed even to spot warning signs of this particular form of radicalization, even to be aware of it, let alone to support young people to be more resistant to it or to, in some cases, extract them from it. So it seemed to me that it was important to write about these issues. And as a result, I spent around 18 months to two years undercover in the so-called manosphere. I adopted the persona of a dis disillusioned young white man in his early 20s called Alex, who was unemployed and didn't feel particularly privileged and felt rubbed up the wrong way by the popular discourse that painted him as privileged within our society. Um, what I learned, I think, was that there is a, a sprawling complex web of thousands of websites, forums, blogs, vlogs, groups, organizations and campaigns, which is loosely, and I think rather euphemistically termed the manosphere. Um, within this group, you have a number of different communities, a number of different networks, um, and each of them is fairly complex, but they have a certain amount of overlap. Um, they all exist from a kind of starting point of the dehumanization of women. They describe the realization um, and the recognition of their so-called uh, worldview, the reality that, in fact, women are the oppressors and men are the oppressed, um, as taking the red pill, which is an analogy, of course, that they've borrowed from the Matrix films. That from that point, they then diverge somewhat in terms of how they tend to construct their worlds. And in many of these cases, they use kind of pseudoscientific jargon, um, extremely cherry picked historical references, classical references to try and support the creation of a worldview that they seek to bolster by making it sound kind of academic and impressive. Um, perhaps at the most extreme end um, is a group or an ideology um, known as incels. These are men who aren't having sex but would like to be, um, hence the term they describe themselves as being involuntary celibates. And they blame women categorically for that fact. They perceive women as um, object solely there for the purpose of male sexual gratification. Um, and their ideology is extremely self-contradictory insofar as they um, revile women who have a lot of sex. They use extremely derogatory terminology to describe um, women who they perceive to be promiscuous. But at the same time, they rail against women for not having sex with them. Um, incel was a term that was coined in the mid 1990s by a Canadian bisexual woman woman named Alana who created a, a small online community where people who were unlucky in love could share thoughts and encouragement with each other. But she soon uh, found a partner and drifted away from the community. And it was over the subsequent years that the kind of terminology and the ideology took off, but also became something much darker, much more focused on blaming women than on self-improvement or encouragement. And it became an exclusively male domain. At a very conservative estimate within the UK, um, I would say that we're looking at the very least 10,000 members of groups which are directly affiliated to this ideology. Worldwide, we're talking much more likely in the region of several hundred thousands. Of the four major forums that I studied, each had approximately 10,000 members and around 5 million posts, um, half a million clicks from UK visitors alone each month. 
and around a 25% growth rate over the two years that I was studying them. So these are fast growing communities and they're highly active. For example, at any given time that I logged on, there would be around a thousand online forum members, but also crucially around a thousand non-members viewing and watching the pages. So while we are talking about a relatively small minority of men, we are talking about a highly engaged community that's much larger, I think, than many people would imagine, given the extremity of these um, sites and ideologies. And it's also crucial to recognize the potentially much greater number of people who may be coming into contact with, being influenced by these ideologies, either on the websites themselves or further sort of downstream, if you like, in viral videos and internet memes, whose numbers wouldn't necessarily be counted within those forum memberships. There is very little public awareness concerning the size and reach of these communities. Um, and they are sort of overlapping. So if, if incels consider women to be sexual slot machines, um, essentially rigged against them, and that it's impossible for them ever to get a woman to have sex with them, then pickup artists also see women as sexual slot machines, but they believe that there is a particular winning combination you can learn to type in to force them to pay out every time. The international pickup artist industry is valued at $100 million. It operates with no regulation in almost every country around the world, uh, where men can pay tens of thousands of pounds or dollars on almost any given weekend in almost any major city to be trained in a so-called boot camp by so-called experts to harass, accost, and in the more extreme cases of the ideology, to assault women. This is an ideology and a worldview that is extremely sanitized and euphemized in our public perception of it. So for example, popular culture has held up figures like Joey from Friends or Barney Stinson from How I Met Your Mother as examples of so-called pickup artists who are portrayed as lovable rogues. They're portrayed as, as charming and confident. The reality is very different. The leading lights of this industry who are being paid tens of thousands of pounds to pass on their so-called wisdom to other men are men who have often boasted about rape in their forums, who have argued for it to be legalized on public property, who have posted online videos of themselves assaulting women. And the reality of these websites is that, again, using this kind of psychobabble terminology, this sort of technical language, they're essentially espousing extremely damaging views. They're suggesting that all women secretly want to be raped, um, that there is a phenomenon called LMR or last minute resistance, where many women will say that they've changed their minds just before sex, but that a real alpha man takes what he wants and women really want you to push through that resistance and so on. Then there are um, men who I would say start from that same point of perceiving the world to be inherently stacked against them and in favor of women, but who rather than seeing women as prey, as I would say incels and pickup artists do, um, instead view them as a threat. Um, these groups are men going their own way or MGTOWs as they call themselves and men's rights activists, but they take a different sort of approach to solving the perceived problem. Men going their own way are so convinced that women are evil and dangerous that they cut them out of their lives altogether. They seek to avoid contact with women to the greatest possible degree. Um, uh, they believe that um, false rape allegations are rife. They believe that women are tricking men into raising children that aren't their own by being promiscuous and having children behind their back that they then force so-called cucked men into paying for. And this sounds like an incredibly extreme ideology. Again, um, I think when you talk about this, people say you must be talking about a handful of, of loners. The reality, of course, is that ideologies like this are, in fact, much more mainstreamed than we might realize. Mike Pence, for example, the former vice president, famously said that he would never have dinner alone with any woman other than his wife. And a recent study found that 27% of American men now say that they will avoid one-on-one -on -one meetings with female colleagues in the workplace, fueled, I think, because of an overlap between this kind of ideology and the sort of general anti-feminist online hatred that has suggested in the wake of Me Too that false rape allegations are rife. Then you have men's rights activists who give themselves a veneer of respectability 
by claiming to care about issues really affecting men, issues, for example, like the male mental health crisis and so on, but who in fact devote the vast majority of their time and resources to trying to undermine, defund and attack women and feminist organisations in particular. One particularly violent men's rights website, which published articles like The Necessity of Domestic Violence, receives around 55,000 unique visitors a month. Paul Elam, the founder of A Voice for Men, which is perhaps the most um, recognisable and prominent uh, men's rights organisation, has argued that October, which is Domestic Abuse Awareness Month, should be renamed Bash a Violent Bitch Month. He has over 100,000 subscribers on YouTube and A Voice for Men has 13,000 members. So we are talking about much bigger numbers here than people recognise. And I think it's really important to say that there is obviously an overlap here with the group that we might loosely term online trolls. Um, it's a complex relationship. There are people who will be members of all of these groups. There will be people who will be members of just one of them. There will be young people whose trajectory takes them through these groups in a certain order. Um, but when we talk about online trolling, there is immense overlap with incel and other manosphere ideology, terminology and views. They use um, mass harassment techniques that are shared across the groups like brigading, for example, in Gamergate, when two million tweets were sent in just two months, including bomb threats, death threats and rape threats to feminist campaigners. Um, two and a half thousand messages were sent to the British MP Luciana Berger alone in what was described as a filthy Jew bitch campaign. Um, and a website like 4chan, which you might loosely describe as the Internet's biggest gathering of trolls, receives 28 million unique monthly visitors with its most common demographic being 18 to 34 year old college educated men. Obviously, the impact of this on women is very significant. Almost a quarter of women aged 18 to 55 have experienced online harassment. And a third of female politicians in the UK say that they've considered quitting because of online abuse. I think it's very easy for those who have heard of these groups at all, of which many people haven't, to dismiss them as a very small number of um, damaged or lonely men who need to be pitied. The reality, I think, what's very important to say is that while, of course, there are men who are swept up into these groups uh, because they are vulnerable, um, some of whom may have particular issues, mental health issues and so on. This is not a benign support community for men with a few outliers who are misogynistic. These are groups dedicated to praising and inciting real life violence within incel communities in particular. They revere and hallow the names of men who have committed massacres of women. They actively encourage each other to rape and murder women. They describe this as an incel uprising or a day of retribution, and they perceive it as a kind of glorious opportunity. Um, to put women in their place. And this has had a very major real world impact. So over the last 10 years, um, by my calculation, over 100 people have been killed or seriously injured by men either directly claiming their attacks in the name of incel ideology or with direct links to one or more of these manosphere ideologies. The most famous example, perhaps, is Elliot Roger, who in Santa Barbara murdered six people and injured 14. Alec Manassian, the Toronto van attacker, who murdered 10 people and injured 16, the vast majority of them women. Uh, more recently, a teenager who walked into a massage parlor in Toronto and murdered a woman with a machete. Um, another also in Canada who went into a supermarket and bought knives and then attacked a woman and her baby daughter in the parking lot. There have also been a significant number of attempted or planned attacks in recent months and years, um, which haven't ended up coming to fruition because they've been disrupted. Um, but the idea that these are confined to online echo chambers and that there isn't any real world risk couldn't be further from the truth. And that's not just in terms of violence erupting, but also in terms of the ways in which this ideology spreads offline. So, for example, we know from Cambridge Analytica whistleblower Christopher Wiley that Steve Bannon deliberately used uh, Facebook data to target incels as an important sector of swing state voters. Um, Incelocalypse, one of the uh, worst incel websites that was dedicated to rape as well as paedophilia, was run by a congressional candidate. 
the creator of the Red Pill Reddit and its chief moderator turned out to be a Republican New Hampshire state representative. Offline, he was a respected mainstream politician. Online, he had written that rape wasn't all bad because at least the rapist enjoyed it. And repeatedly, trolls who have abused women and sent them death threats and masses of abuse have been unmasked as respectable businessmen, as uh, coaches of their children's sports teams and so on. So this has real world overlap, both in terms of the violence and in terms of the impact and the ideology. There is also a significant overlap here with other forms of online extremism, as other speakers have already pointed out. There is significant overlap and back and forth between these groups. Um, in particular, when we're looking at male supremacy, there is particular overlap with white supremacy and the far right. You can see this in a number of different ways. You can see it in the language, the fact that the lexicon of incels, which is almost a language in and of itself, turns up within the language used by the far right and white supremacist. It comes up when you look at particular individuals who made their name perhaps in anti-feminist attacks during Gamergate and have now on, gone on to become darlings of the far right. Um, it shows up in terms of real life attacks. So for example, the Hanau terrorist attack in Germany, which is widely referred to as a white supremacist attack, but was also committed by an individual with professed incel beliefs. And you can see how we struggle to recognize those two things alongside each other and the nuance of that, for example, in the coverage of the horrendous attacks that happened uh, in Atlanta, where the predominant uh, victims were Asian women, and there was a real difficulty for the press in grasping the nuance that both of those factors were important, that, that it could have been a racialized and a misogynistic attack, um, as of course we saw in the fact that the killer said that he was trying to take out temptation, um, but a lot of people didn't recognize the particular hypersexualized, um, submissive, sexualized stereotypes, racialized stereotypes of Asian women that may have fed into that ideology. In terms of how this is happening, what became very clear in my research is that there is a very deliberate and targeted grooming and radicalization of particularly very young boys that's happening online, very much below the radar, very much without much awareness of it amongst teachers or parents. 89% um, of US teens say that they're online almost constantly or at least several times a day. 85% of them use YouTube. And while we adults tend to think of YouTube as the home of movie trailers and grumpy cat videos, for young people, the majority of them say it's where they get their news. In light of those facts, it's particularly significant that repeated reports, in particular from data and society, have shown that YouTube is in the grip of what you might describe as a kind of alt-right, uh, extremist, misogynistic influencer network. And of course, as we've already heard, um, online algorithms on social media very much, perhaps unintentionally, play into and um, and increase this particular problem because they want to focus on watch time above all else and because we know that increasing severity, increasing extremism of content is what keeps people watching. Um, this isn't something that matters if you start out looking at a video about um, baking and end up watching an all-you-can-eat hot dog competition, but it comes more serious if you start by looking at a fairly tame video about feminism and within a few videos suggested by the algorithm you find yourself watching um, somebody who's persuading you that women should be stripped of the vote, that women should be kept as sex slaves and so on. Um, we know from the online materials of these groups that they are very deliberate about the ways in which they use social media. They describe targeting boys as young as 11. They describe the use of um, cultural touch points, Instagram memes and humor as adding cherry flavor to children's medicine. In other words, it is very deliberate that there is a slippery slope trajectory here, that boys don't necessarily go online looking for an incel forum, that they might not even have heard the word incel, but that they are being sucked in by a kind of gradual slippery slope of jokes and so-called banter, so-called irony, um, and that it gets to a certain point where nobody's joking anymore but you couldn't necessarily put your finger on where that point was and of course we're seeing vulnerable boys being sucked into these different ideologies alongside each other because 
you can't separate incel ideology, which is inherently racist, from white supremacy. Incels are not just furious that women aren't sleeping with them. They're furious that women are sleeping with non-white men. They have extremely offensive terminology that's used to describe women of color. Um, and of course, at the absolute foundation point of white supremacist terrorism, are extreme misogyny, extremely misogynistic beliefs. For example, the so-called replacement theory, which of course is, is painfully prominent in the news at the moment, is based on the idea of forcing women to breed a race of white babies. Um, it, it's inherently talking about depleting a dehumanized resource of uh, fragile and vulnerable white women um, whilst demonizing men of color. Um, these are groups which have advocated for the forced sterilization of women of color. So you cannot see these as two separate forms of extremism when they're so closely intertwined. It's important to understand, I think, that we don't recognize this as a form of terrorism. We are only now belatedly beginning to recognize white supremacy as a form of terrorism, but even fewer cases see incel terrorism, men who are attacking and murdering women because they have been radicalized to hate women online and want to make women fear them, defined as terrorism. In the whole world only once have terror charges been brought against uh, somebody who murdered in the name of this ideology in a single case in Canada. Um, even in the case of the Alec Manassian attack, for example, when he wrote about Elliot Roger and the incel rebellion and uprising online just before carrying out his massacre, terror charges were not brought. And as recently as last summer, when Jake Davison carried out the biggest um, shooting massacre that we've seen in the UK for over 10 years, after having been heavily involved in incel ideology online, within hours of the attack, the police, the government and media were all reporting and clearly saying that they had ruled out any possibility of terrorist involvement. What this means is that we aren't in any meaningful sense tracking, uh, taking action, keeping a record of, monitoring, um, or taking action against these particular ideologies. For example, when I was researching for men who hate women, I rang up a number of uh, government agencies and organizations dealing with terrorism and extremism to ask them about incels. And I tended to come up against either a complete blank or in one particular case, somebody pausing and then asking me if I could spell it. A US Government Accountability Office report, for example, on violent extremism um, makes no mention of incels or uh, male supremacy, even though it covers a period during which George Sedini, Elliot Roger and Chris Harper Mercer killed 18 people and injured 31 more. However, the report does track people who are seen as extremists because they have extreme views on public ownership of land, for example, um, or on abortion or animal rights, even though during that period no one had been murdered in the name of those ideologies. So until we recognize that this is a form of terrorism, when it meets all of the international definitions for that, until we recognize that boys being sucked into this ideology are being groomed and radicalized, just as they are in other forms of extremism, it will remain very difficult to tackle this because at the moment, it really is flying completely under the radar. Thank you. Kia ora. hello Laura, um, thank you for your talk today. Um, my name's Eva, we've been corresponding over email. Um, I'm Head of Policy here at CCDH. Um, I just had a couple of questions, sort of drawing on some of the themes that you raised through your speech. Um, the first of them actually uh, relates to, like, and you've touched on this already, but what more can you tell us about the intersections of online misogynistic abuse and how different groups are affected by this? So certainly we're seeing a um, big overlap with other forms of online extremism and hatred. Um, and sometimes what this means is that we're seeing the dissemination of racist and sexist views alongside each other. But sometimes what it means is that we're actually seeing anti-feminism and misogyny in particular seen as a recruiting pathway by the far right and white supremacists. So, um, for example, leading sort of white supremacists like Andrew Anglin have openly written about this and they've written about 
the fact that they perceive anti-feminism as an easier sell. So they see it as a kind of uh, doorway to uh, racist extremism, as a way of drawing boys in, perhaps I think in part because of the kind of mainstream social acceptability of sexist views. And this I think is where we need also to pay attention to what's happening in the mainstream media, because these extremist groups are obsessed with what they describe as the Overton window, the kind of window of uh, socially acceptable discourse. And when they see figures like Donald Trump, who they perceive to be widening that window by saying things that people previously would have considered sort of uh, uh, unacceptable to say, or when they see mainstream media platforms, sometimes in the name of balance, asking questions like, for example, here in the UK, um, is me to a witch hunt? Um, are vulnerable men losing their jobs to false claims by women, even though there isn't any evidence to back that up? It makes it that much easier for these groups to recruit boys online because what they're seeing online seems that little bit less extreme and unreasonable if it they've seen a kind of sanitized version of it in the mainstream. Well, thank you. Um, in one of the later chapters of your book, you speak about the role that men can play in challenging misogyny in its different forms. Uh, can you outline some of the key components that would help with that? Absolutely. Um, these groups are incredibly adept at meeting boys where they are. So, for example, we're not necessarily seeing them relying on boys going and finding an incel website. They are coming to boys and they are using as kind of recruiting ground. Um, sports training websites. 97% of teenage boys play video games and these guys are on the headsets. They are recruiting boys through gaming live streams and strategy chat rooms and teen bodybuilding forums where there are 10 times as many posts on one very popular mainstream bodybuilding forum about manosphere and anti-feminist ideology than any other section on the site. What that means is that if we want to have the opposite effect if we want to tackle this we need to meet boys where they are we need to have conversations with boys we need to provide boys with spaces where they feel heard where they feel um, that sense of community and purpose and all of the things that are so seductive about these websites and that's something that men in their lives can provide men can give boys this sense of community a sense of role models um, a sense of belonging and being part of something and they have the opportunity to shape what that looks like. So whether it's volunteering at sports clubs or local community centers, um, whether it's having uh, regular chats with young men in your life, whether that's your own son or relatives or children of friends, I think men have an opportunity to disrupt some of these norms and to question some of these norms before they become too entrenched. Um, this is happening from a very young age. And as we all know, it is much easier to prevent radicalization than it is to attempt to de-radicalize and extricate somebody. And I think that men have a real role to play in that, in having open and perhaps sometimes uncomfortable conversations with the young men in their lives. Thank you, Laura. Um, and thank you for all the work you do. I really enjoyed your book, Men Who Hate Women, even though it was really hard uh, reading as well. Re hard but essential reading and would recommend to others here. Um, it also correlates what you were saying about death threats with recent research we've done on misogyny online and looking at Instagram DMs with five high-profile women and the failure of uh, Instagram to respond to those in 90% of cases, um, which was just appalling. Um, I am going to say thank you again for your time and for zooming in from the UK.